So my name is David Everett, and uh, that is the building that houses all of those organizations that Jenny just mentioned, uh, and uh, that's on the Massey University campus. So it's a new building, and it houses about 150 scientists and administrators who work in, in food science. Um, so I'm originally from Australia, as uh, uh, I don't know whether you can tell from my accent anymore, but it's <laughs> been a long time since I've lived there. And uh, more recently ended up in, in New Zealand, uh, where I've been for the last uh, 20 years, except for various forays into other uh, countries like Canada and the US and Ireland and places like that. So I've worked in dairy science for, let me just count this up, 35 years. So uh, it's uh, a long time to be working in cheese. And uh, a lot of it has been in cheese uh, in cheese research, uh, but more recently examining uh, some of the bioactives that are present in dairy products. Uh, please don't ask me any questions about seaweed. That's a new project uh, we just got funding for. And um, uh, I think uh, when I was applying for the, for the grant, I, I think I could pick out seaweed and what it looked like, but that's about as far as I, much as I knew about that particular topic. Uh, so let's get on with the talk. So that's not gonna work. Let's see if we can do this. There we go. So there you see the beautiful cow of paradise from Norway. Um, I, I, I don't know whether that's the actual title of the cow or not, but uh, it looks quite rather majestic sitting up there in the mountains. This is an outline of the presentation. And for bioactives, I, I've, um, uh, over the years, I've discovered that there is not just a lot of information, but there's libraries filled with information on bioactives, uh, particularly when it relates to, to milk and dairy products. So this is gonna be a very brief overview because we only have one hour just to, uh, to, to talk about this. Some of the things that I think are, are interesting, some of the things that I think are upcoming in the future, uh, and, um, and then we'll uh, uh, finish off with some questions and answers. So uh, that's the summary. So we'll talk, uh, start out with just what the source of the bioactives are, what their functionality is, how to purify them. At least there's, there's one particular method about purifying certain kinds of peptides. Effects of processing. And a very key area, I think, is the humanization of infant formula. So I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you what that means later on in the talk. The effect of digestion on bioactivity, some of the health claims, some commercial products. And I have listed some of these products in previous talks for Dairy Australia. In this case, I've updated that to add, add a few new products in there as well. And then finally, ways that we can uh, protect these bioactive compounds when we consume them or when we put them into food products. So just a definition, and uh, this is my definition, other people have their own eyes, I would suppose, but any kind of a component that's delivered to the target tissue in the human body in an efficacious form to deliver physical or cognitive met metabolic health benefits. Uh, so that I think it encompasses a lot. Functional foods is another term that you've probably heard and functional foods is, is a much broader term because functionality can mean many different things, not just bioactivity, but it can mean things like nutrition, health, flavor, texture, preservation, and, and as you name it, there's lots of different properties that you can put under the heading of functional foods. So bioactive foods or bioactive ingredients would be a subset of that. So here we have some of the bioactive components that are present in milk or the functionality. And there's a lot of them. So I won't read them out because you'll get a copy of these, these uh, uh, slides in a PDF format that you can take a look at. But there's a lot of stuff in there. And uh, you, you can tell from that that... Um, uh, that uh, apparently from this list, milk is a very a very uh, healthy product to eat and, or drink. And there's lots of things that it will do to improve your health. But there are some caveats when we look at this list. I will cover some of these uh, functional, functional properties later on in the talk. So the, 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 the first question is, does the same effect occur in isolated and purified bioactive formulations compared to whole dairy food products? And that's a, that's a, a growing area of, of health and nutrition is what's called uh, um, uh, sustainable nutrition or how does the dairy matrix or a food matrix interact with the bioactives to alter the bioactivity. And uh, I, again, I'll cover that a little bit later. And the second uh, question is what affects do processing steps? Because of course we need to process the milk to be able to extract and purify the bioactive components, have on the release of bioactives into the human body and the bioactive functionality. 
So those are very important questions to consider and, and we'll get to that. So the source of them in milk, and uh, I, I uh, please don't ask me how you pour the milk out of that milk jug. I'm not sure whether the horns come off or not, but uh, that's a, a picture I found many years ago that kind of, a, it's amusing. So in milk, there are proteins, and this is very broad classes of components, proteins, vitamins, minerals, lipids, lactose, and also the milk fat globule membrane, which contains lipids and also proteins. So within proteins, you've got enzymes, many enzymes, immunoglobulins, which are known to have uh, uh, preservative effects, uh, peptides and growth factors. In the lipid fraction, you'll get short chain fatty acids, which are, are good for uh, uh, helping with anti-inflammation. And in lactose, a component called oligosaccharides. So lactose is a disaccharide, as I'm sure you all know. It's got two simple sugars connected together. Uh, glucose and galactose, but with oligosaccharides, you're going to get two, three, four, or even more of these connected up into a chain, and they have very specific health benefits. So I've always been told that trans fatty acids are not particularly healthy, and uh, years ago, people who consumed a lot of trans fatty acids, which was put into margarine, ended up with even worse health problems. Uh, these were chemically produced trans fatty acids to make uh, plant-based oils more solid like to produce uh, a margarine product uh, but the ones that are ruminant produced have been known to reduce type 2 diabetes so that apparently is different from the chemical way that we produce trans fatty acids uh, um, historically to make margarine of course it's not done like that now it's um, they want to try and minimize the amount of trans fatty acids short chain fatty acids I've already mentioned complex lipids that these are the lipids that are found on the membrane of the milk fat globule they have cognitive effects also anti-infective anti and anti-inflammatory. Uh, casein peptides, uh, that has an impact upon, and I can't read that because it's got a picture of me over the, over the words here, hang on. <laughs> Reduces solubility of cholesterol uh, in bile, salt, mixed micelles. So that has the impact of reducing the uptake of cholesterol uh, when you have a, um, a dairy diet. Lysozyme and lactoperoxidase, these are enzymes that have antimicrobial properties. And uh, here are some um, peptides here. So the first are two tripeptides. Uh, they're found from caseins and they have anti-inflammatory properties as well. And uh, this is what's called ACE inhibition, which I'll come to later. And it's found in soured milk where there's some uh, Lactobacillus helveticus or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, that's growing in the soured milk. Uh, one, of course, the first is a bacteria, the second is a yeast that you would use to make beer traditionally. And then finally, uh, uh, that other uh, pentapeptide down there, which shows hypocholesteremic effects, oligosaccharides, the functionality they have are that some of them are antibacterial, but they also act as prebiotics. And what that does is that it enables our colon, our, lo our lower gut to colonize probiotic bacteria because then they have something to eat, which would be the prebiotics, uh, in this case, the oligosaccharides. And finally, beta lactic globin itself, which is a whole whey protein. <clears throat> and that has uh, essential amino acids as do the, 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 the other whey proteins and enables the neonate or the newborn to uptake long chain fatty acids and retinol. So that's just sort of a very, very broad overview. These are what the oligosaccharides look like. There's about 200 of these in human milk. <clears throat> and that, it's about 12 to 15 grams per liter. And it's much, much less in bovine milk. So if we want to be able to extract these oligosaccharides out, which are used in uh, the production of human infant formula, then we have uh, limited options here. Uh, with bovine milk, you'll get much less of it. So you've got to produce more milk and process more milk to be able to get the same amount of oligosaccharides. And they won't be the same as what you'll necessarily find in human milk. So some of these health implications, the prebiotic effect, direct effect on immune cells, brain nutrition, resistance to colonization by pathogens. And uh, uh, that also works as an anti-infective -in receptor analog for pathogens. So the pathogens want to bind in, in to the, the oligosaccharides instead of to our, uh, our cells. So that's a sort of a picture and you don't need to look too much at that, but uh, later on after the talk, you can examine that at your, your leisure. 
And uh, I've included some references down the bottom of some of these slides so you can take a look at um, more details if you wish. So a comparison between human and bovine mature milk. So on the left, we've got some bioactive compounds, the functionality in the second column, and then the third and the fourth, I've got the amount in human milk and the amount in bovine milk. So the ones that I've colored red there are where it's in much greater concentration. And that's the way nature's designed our, our milk production system in humans and, and cows, uh, that uh, of course, infants, human infants are very different to calves. And so they have different nutritional and, uh, and health requirements. And so the makeup of the milk is going to be different. So for humans, you're going to find a lot of lactoferrin and oligosaccharides compared to bovine milk. Now, both of those are used in infant formula. So again, if you're going to use bovine milk as a source of these, then you're going to have to process a lot of milk. And of course, that produces a lot of byproducts, which you've then got to use in the dairy processing industry. Um, calcium uh, is, is much higher in bovine milk, and uh, that's because there's more casein in bovine milk where the, where the, where the calcium is located. And that enables the calf to grow a lot more quickly than humans, as you can observe very easily. Uh, we don't uh, apparently need as much calcium uh, when we're newborns. Uh, lactoperoxidase is higher in bovine, and then xanthine oxidoreductase is also. And I will uh, um, discuss those later on. So you may have heard of milk extracellular exosomes. So these are very small. They're, they're nanoparticles. Well, they're on the large size of being nanoparticles, typically less than 100 nanometers in size. And they're different to fat globules. They look uh, superficially the same as a fat globule with the, the complex lipids surrounding the inner core. But a milk fat globule has three layers, and this has two layers. And that results in an aqueous interior of the exosome where you'll find all of those components uh, that are listed there. Uh, these can be built, constructed synthetically, and you can put what you like in it. It doesn't have to be what's listed there. Uh, they are enriched in cholesterol and sphingomyelin around the outside, and that has a very important effect, those two compounds, on the rate of lipid digestion. Uh, and uh, if you are consuming uh, lipids, which we all do, most of us do, then the rate of lipid digestion is very important for the uptake of lipids into our bloodstream. So we want to try and uh, regulate that as much as possible. And that's the role played by cholesterol and sphingomyelin in a natural milk fat globule membrane. So there are some health implications uh, there, help to prevent uh, necrotizing enterocolitis, immune system, gastrointestinal tract regulation. And it also interestingly crosses the, what's called the epithelial and endothelial barrier. So that's in your, in, your, in your gut, in your intestines. It can cross that barrier uh, into, into the bloodstream. It's also digestion insensitive. Uh, so that means it's not going to be destroyed so much if you consume it uh, orally. And so it can be uh, developed into a, 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 an oral-based uh, functional food product. So just to briefly go through some of these, some of the key bioactives that are found in milk. The first is lactoferrin. And one of its roles is to bind uh, ferric ions, that's Fe3+. And it comes in uh, various uh, formats. One has no iron in it, it's the APO, and the other one has uh, one to two iron um, ions, iron ions that are bound. That's called the hollow lactoferrin. And uh, it's, it's called a glycoprotein, which means it has sugars attached to it. And uh, again, there's some figures there that uh, illustrate uh, clearly that it's going to be found much at a much higher level in human milk compared to bovine milk, and also in human cholest uh, colostrum rather than mature human milk. So often you'll find that this colostrum, uh, as you know, is a very different product to milk. It's uh, the pre-milk that comes uh, postpartum when the calf or, or the infant, human infant is born. And it is rich in a lot of bioactives that, that differs in its uh, amounts and also the, the, the profile of the bioactives compared to mature human milk. Since 86, it's been added to infant formula. And uh, there's some of the products, uh, that some of the functional properties there, reduces coliforms, uh, that you don't, that's, that's a, something you don't want growing. Increases bifidobacteria, which you do want growing because that uh, uh, gives immunity over a lifetime to, to the human infant. 
Um, produces antimicrobial peptides when it's uh, digested. One of them is called lactoferrocin. And it has antibacterial properties, antiviral properties, interesting against HIV, uh, it's listed there. And the antibacterial functionality is where it competes for iron. So if you find that there are pathogens that want, that, that require iron in order to, uh, to um, uh, live, then if lactoferrin can compete with a bacteria and compete more successfully, it'll stop the bacteria from growing. It can also bind to bacterial surfaces and, and disrupt it. So also that prevents, uh, prevents bacterial growth of some pathogens. So there's uh, uh, some other interesting things there that oral intake reduces uh, giardia colonization, infant diarrhea. Um, in vitro pig studies, it's, uh, it uh, stimulates pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And so we get the balance right so that we don't have uh, uh, what are called cytokine storms that might be produced in the body, which are some of the things that happen for people who have COVID. Um, antioxidant, anti-binding, anti-inflammatory properties. And I also discovered this nasal spray here. And I, I think it's a Spanish company and tried to find their website, but was not able to, but you can certainly buy it on Amazon. And uh, this apparently has uh, a uh, inhibitory effect on the SARS-CoV-2 uh, 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 virus early in the infection stage. Um, so there's quite a bit of work looking at oral formulations and nasal spray formulations to prevent viral infections, including COVID-19. So there are products produced by uh, dairy companies, and we'll talk about that. Lactoperoxidase and lysozyme, these are antibacterial. So they are resistant down to acid pH 3, which means that if you have an empty stomach with a lower pH, it's not going to survive all that well, but it'll survive much better on a full stomach with a pH is higher. It produces what are known as reactive oxygen species. So that's the way that it kills off uh, um, bacteria that you don't want growing. Uh, unfortunately, it's uh, partially inactivated at pasteurization temperatures. Well, in this case, a couple of degrees higher than pasteurization temperature, but uh, uh, there is some impact upon its uh, efficacy by, uh, by heat treating it. Uh, the amount in bovine milk is listed there, and it uh, is what's part of, it, it's part of what's called the LP system, the lactoperoxidase system. We're in the presence of things like hydrogen peroxide and that SCN is called thiocyanate. It produces other compounds that have a very strong antibacterial activity. And this has been uh, approved for use as sort of a temporary preservative method by Codex Alimentarius back in 1991. And I found a, a report that uh, I think it was in Kenya or Nigeria, uh, um, somewhere in Africa, that milk transport for eight hours at up to 30 degrees in field trials showed no increase in total plate count. Um, of course, we have uh, different ways of doing it uh, here. We don't necessarily need to uh, transport milk uh, in this particular way. We can always pasteurize it and refrigerate it, which is probably a more uh, effective way of, uh, of transporting milk. Um, and uh, some of the things that it does, it can damage bacterial cell walls resulting in rupture, which is another way of uh, um, bactericidal activity. And it's very similar to alpha lactalbumin, which is... Uh, uh, and it's present in egg white and it's added to Swiss cheese or it can be added to Swiss cheese. I don't know how common this is to prevent clostridial blowing of the cheese. So that's a lot of gas formation that produces um, 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 hydrogen, which you don't want in cheese. And again, down the bottom there, you'll find that there's more of that in the human milk compared to the bovine milk. A uh, glycomacropeptide is, is quite interesting. That's uh, on the right there, we see a casein micelle and surrounding that, we have what's called a hairy layer. Uh, it's probably not a very scientific term, but it's a stabilizing layer for the casein micelle in milk. So uh, if you didn't have that stabilizing layer there, instead of milking a cow, you would be cheesing a cow because that's what you'd get out of the udder uh, or some kind of a curd clot. So the way that works in cheese making is the, uh, the chymosin enzyme moves around the outside and it cleaves off uh, that, that uh, hairy layer. Uh, that's part of the kappa casein molecule. And so the, the bit that protrudes out into the, the water phase of milk is called glycomacropeptide, highly glycosylated byproduct of cheese manufacture. Has no ar aromatic amino acids, which 
doesn't sound that interesting, but uh, there is a, a health implication for that that I'll get to. The bit that's left behind on the casein micelle is called paracapa casein. Uh, that's most of the kappa casein. It has anti-pathogen adhesive function, binds to E. coli and cholera endotoxins, has antiviral activity. Uh, interestingly, it prevents binding of a cariogenic bacteria on your teeth. And there's a couple listed there. And that's in in, in vitro study using uh, uh, hydroxyapatite, which is calcium phosphate saliva beads, not with uh, in vivo studies. Uh, bifidogenic, so again, you get that nice bifidobacteria growing in, in your gut as, as well. Uh, let's see, going down there to the second last point, there is a dis genetic disorder called uh, phenylketonuria, which is an in inability to metabolize phenylalanine, one of the amino acids, by the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase. So those sufferers, which is a evident at birth, or shortly after birth, that they can't, um, that they have this uh, this genetic disorder, can't eat proteins with phenylalanine in it, which is an awful lot of proteins. So as I mentioned before, GMP has no aromatic amino acids, which includes the phenylalanine. So that can be used to make an infant formula that's very low in aromatic amino acids with no phenylalanine, and it can be used to, uh, to provide nutrition to a, a neonate that has that uh, genetic disorder. So that's one application of, um, of this. Awful lot of it's produced, by the way. It's uh, a key ingredient in cheese whey. Question is, does it survive the low pH gastric uh, um, environment? Um, none of this has been found in the intestines, no fragments in the stool or blood. Uh, and so we don't know whether it actually passages through the gastric uh, stomach into the intestines or not at this point. But again, that doesn't matter if you're producing a GMP infant formula to, uh, to uh, ameliorate the, the phenylketonuria disorder, then I guess it doesn't matter whether it passages through or not. So, oh, by the way, uh, I've, said, I've just said it before in many seminars, but uh, down the bottom right, the, the main purpose of the casein micelle is not nutritional for the proteins, it's to deliver calcium in a bioavailable and dispersed form. So the calcium is those little gray dots that you'll see in the casein micelle. Uh, now, calcium phosphate is how it's, it's found in milk. Calcium phosphate is uh, highly insoluble. And so uh, that's the boiler scale that you see sometimes at the bottom of a kettle, partly caused by that. that uh, and so you can't have dissolved calcium phosphate in milk. So it has to be packaged in a protein uh, format so it can exist in the, the watery phase of the milk uh, and, and then be bioavailable to, the, uh, to the, the calf or the human infant. So immunoglobulins, a very important whey protein. They confer biological uh, immunity to the neonate. They are there to detect foreign matter such as pathogenic bacteria and viruses. A human milk is dominant in one of the five classes called IgA, uh, whereas uh, bovine milk is dominant in the IgG uh, antigen. And that's a schematic on the right. So you've got the, the heavy chain on the bottom, you've got the light chain, and you've got the interaction of the immunoglobulin with the antigens, which is the foreign matter, which could be bacteria or viruses, and, but in particular, the surfaces of the bacteria or viruses. Uh, so it can have a synergistic effect along with lactoperoxidase, lysozyme, and also lactoferrin in products such as milk and colostrum. I have been told that, uh, sorry, somebody told me here in New Zealand about uh, farmers, storing colostrum in tanks out in the open, uh, sealed off from the environment, but there's no refrigeration at all. And after a month, there was still no bacterial growth in the colostrum, uh, which is, I, th I think illustrates quite well what's present in colostrum has a very uh, effective uh, uh, bacteriostatic effect on, on the colostrum. Uh, unfortunately, it, it's, it's um, chemically goes rancid and it doesn't doesn't smell very nice but uh, it's microbially safe um so we have uh, the effect down the bottom there of this different heat treatments such as pasteurization and we lose a lot of that ig activity uh, with uht and evaporation you destroy almost all the immune activity so it's not going to be all that useful in a uht product um, you can add bovine Ig to UHT milk, and it retains its activity over a six-month period. 
and some of the functional uh, health properties there, uh, prevention of diarrheas, dental caries, uh, dysentery, gastritis, and cryptosporidiosis. Um, right, opioid peptoids. These are for pain relief, anesthesia, lowering blood pressure, and sedation. So one that you may be familiar with is beta casomorphin 7. Now that's found in, in beta casein. It's a uh, seven peptide, uh, that would be a heptapeptide, seven amino acids. It's found in digested A1 milk. So you have to digest the milk in order to get the peptide out, but it's not found in A2 milk. And uh, some of you might be familiar uh, from publications 20 years ago, there were all sorts of outrageous claims made about A2 milk, um, reducing things like, um, uh, what were some of the things? It was uh, all sorts of things that weren't you, you wouldn't expect. Uh, autism was one, I remember that one. And uh, so th these are quite uh, unsubstantiated claims that were made back then, all statistical correlations with no cause and effect. Um, but I think that the A2 Corporation now is, is promoting this as a product that um, does um, result in a di more digestive comfort, which is, a, uh, I guess, something that uh, uh, people have observed when they're drinking it. Um, other ones that are listed there, uh, lactoferoxins from lactoferrin, uh, caseoxins from kappa casein. Uh, and then uh, down the bottom, angiotensin 1 converting enzyme inhibitory peptides. So that's what the ACE refers to that I mentioned in one of the early slides, angiotensin converting enzyme used for treatment of high blood pressure. And it's a complex uh, series of reactions that's found in the, uh, the, the hydrolysis digest from trypsin of um, all the caseins and, whey and uh, alpha lac and beta lac proteins. Uh, interestingly, beta casomorphin 7, the opioid, is also an ACE inhibitory peptide. And it was first discovered in snake venom. So there we go, which is unusual. So I don't know what happened that somebody was bitten by a snake and found they had uh, lower blood pressure or what. So some of these compounds are heat sensitive. So that is a problem when we, when we have to um, uh, process milk. And I've got a list of them there and their function. And uh, I'm going to leave that uh, without uh, saying too much, except I'll point out alkaline phosphatase, and, and many of you are familiar with the alkaline phosphatase test for pasteurization, but it also uh, detoxifies um, lipopolysaccharide endotoxin in the intestines and prevents inflammation. So that was something I didn't know about alkaline phosphatase. Uh, and uh, so it has a uh, more than one, one, one use in milk. So non-thermal processing is one way to get away from that uh, thermal liability and the reduction in activity when you heat those products. Uh, so in order of uh, heat sensitivity, lactoferrin is the most, um, the most sensitive, uh, lipopolysaccharides would be the least. And there's different kinds of techniques such as uh, UVC light treatments, ultraviolet C light treatments, uh, very and, and thermal ultrasonification. So these are very similar to high temperature, short time pasteurization for an activation. Um, low temperature, long time, that's the batch pasteurization, uh, can uh, destroy uh, bile salts stimulated lipase, and that's needed for lipid digestion. But with high pressure processing or with raw milk, you get about 50% of the activity preserved. So that, I think that should be high pressure processing of raw milk preserves 50% of the activity, not all raw milk. And uh, microwave assisted heating uh, doesn't have much of an impact upon fatty acids or oligosaccharide, but it's, it's more effective at preserving the activity of lactoferrin and immunoglobulins compared to batch pasteurization. Just note that that's 60 degrees for 30 seconds, whereas batch is 63 degrees for 30 minutes. So this is one way of isolating uh, uh, peptides from a, a dairy stream. So we start out with milk, we take the fat out to get skim milk, we precipitate the casein using acid to get uh, whey. So we uh, filter off the supernatant to get the whey product. We can then hydrolyze using uh, um, that particular, uh, an enzyme found in that organism, uh, plus high, um, high temperature short time pasteurization to inactivate uh, other enzymes. Uh, so I can get that around the right way. The A orase is going to hydrolyze the lactose and then we 
pasteurize it to inactivate the enzyme. So we get these simple sugars coming out of it, which we can then ultra filtrate, filtrate at two bar, 50 degrees C for 10, uh, 10 kilodalton cutoff. We get permeate uh, peptides coming through. We can then dye a filter to wash them to clear out the thing that we don't want. And then we get uh, these peptides, which we can then concentrate using nanofiltration. And based on this technique, uh, there's about 3,400 peptides identified in the retentate of the nanofiltrate with a concentration of about 3.7 milligrams per mil. So a relatively high concentration there of these peptides, which you can then use in various formulations or you can isolate further to find out what the, the functionality is. Uh, these are some of the compounds or the number of compounds that are produced using different kinds of uh, caseins and whey proteins. So bioactive compounds, and then in the third column, the antimicrobial compounds in the total. And some of those bioactive functionality is listed down the bottom of the slide. So I'll talk briefly about the milk fat globule membrane. I, I mentioned before that unlike exosomes with two layers, this has three layers. And uh, the three layers are, if I can show you this. So we've got a, a bilayer at the, at the top here, and then we have a, a monolayer, which anchors the fat of the milk fat globule. So this is sort of a cutaway of the membrane here. So the fat globule sits at the, below this, where the trace of glycerides is indicated. And we get a lot of different kinds of uh, proteins and uh, a lot of them are glycosylated and complex lipids. And, and uh, most of them have some kind of bioactivity associated with them. So what do we get? Uh, these are functional components in human milk formula. And of those, those are ones that are found in the milk fat globule membrane. So those are, uh, have very specific health claims associated with them. Some of the health claims have weak evidence, some have stronger evidence, um, but it's uh, all done in, uh, in lab studies. These are very important, particularly the sphingomyelin. That's, a, that's an example of a sphingolipid and ganglioside for cognitive function in a growing infant. And in terms of uh, the amount that's found in human milk, it's higher than in cow's milk. And that again is higher than you would find in milk-based infant formula and higher again than you would find in soy-based infant formula, which is quite interesting. So let's look at humanization of infant formula. On the left there, we've got a micrograph of infant formula and the green is, is protein, the red is fat. And uh, the first thing you'll notice is that the fat is, uh, is uh, quite small. And uh, when you use homogenization techniques to produce infant formula, you're going to get very small fat globules. And coating that, you will see here around this particular fat globule is a green phase. And that is a protein that stabilizes uh, stabilizes the fat globule. So these, um, compared to this, the infant formula and human milk, you'll see, first of all, that the fat globules are much larger. And also surrounding the fat globules, you're going to get what you saw in that milk fat globule uh, schematic diagram I showed you before. You're going to get the complex lipids and you're going to get milk fat globule proteins, not necessarily what's present here in a formulation. This is a humanized modified infant formula where we have, um, we've isolated the proteins and lipids that are present on the milk fat globule membrane. And that's shown in green here. And we've taken that from buttermilk. That's a very rich in this kind of, a, 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 in the, these compounds. And we've used that to produce larger fat globules that are coated with something that you would normally find in, in uh, cow's milk. So this is going some way towards humanizing the infant formula on the left, but not quite as far as you'd get in the middle with human milk. So I think that's quite an important development is, is in making infant formula a little resemble more what you would find in human milk with the same kind of nutritional and health outcomes. Of course, human breast milk is the best, the best kind of milk for the human baby. But in some instances, of course, it's not possible to, um, uh, to use breast milk. So these are some uh, uh, kind of sources of digestive enzymes that are found, and they have an impact upon 
uh, producing these milk peptides and some of the uh, properties you'll see there on the right. Uh, milk is partially digested in the mammary gland to produce peptides that protect against infection. Um, they're stable through the stomach and into the intestines. And term babies, not the premature, but the term babies have more bioactive peptides in the stomach compared to the premature. So the questions remain, do these bioactive peptides survive the low pH in the stomach and do they reach the most uh, useful place in the human body? So I'm going to go through some uh, products here that I've uh, uncovered. The first is uh, um, buttermilk powder, which is not strictly speaking a, a bioactive product on itself, but it, is, uh, it does have bioactive components uh, as, um, as, as, as part of its composition. Historically, a low value product, but you'll see the price is rising over the years. This is a five year period. So it's, uh, it's going up quite considerably. So I think that enables the dairy industry to start looking at this more closely and processing it to get some of those bioactives out uh, since the price is going up. So the first one I want to talk about is Recaldent. This was developed by a professor at University of Melbourne Dental School back in the eighties, uh, Eric Reynolds. And uh, this is basically the terminal part of beta casein, which is called casein phosphopeptide. So it's a, a 28 amino acid peptide and it contains phosphorylated serines, which link up with calcium phosphate. So this can be used in chewing gum, can be used in tooth mousse, and uh, which is applied directly to the teeth. And that uh, helps to remineralize the, uh, the tooth. And this is a lot different to consuming antacids, which might have calcium phosphate in it. This is, uh, this is the calcium phosphate in this particular format is very bioavailable and more closely resembles what you'll find in, in your teeth. Um, so these are some, uh, some products that are uh, either currently on the market or uh, in the case of the one on the bottom there, um, it's found in Japan. That one I think is, that one I think is also chewing gum. I can't read Japanese. Uh, Meg Milk Snow Brand, uh, these are some products that I was finding on my trawl through the internet. So we have milk powder with those cognitive lipid components that are found in the milk fat globule membrane. Also MBP, which is used for um, uh, regulating the activity of bone destroying osteoclast cells and it stimulates the production of collagen. So those are a couple of products. All this information is publicly available, by the way, so nothing confidential here. Uh, Fonterra produced phospholipids. Um, I haven't found gangliosides recently, but that is a product that was sold uh, and was on their website, but I couldn't find it more recently. Uh, lactoferrin, uh, MFGM lipids, and pediatric grade regular whole milk skim milk powder. Friesland Campina, uh, these are the Dutch lady growing up milk products, again, filled with these complex uh, lipids, which are, uh, again, good for cognitive uh, development. May also have cognitive impacts upon older people too. Meiji, um, same thing again, we have uh, different kinds of products that are fortified with complex lipids. Cerebral, and also retinal development in this case. Uh, Tatua here in New Zealand, lactoferrin, lactoperoxidase, fossil lipid concentrate, beta serum powder. Uh, those are uh, uh, functional products that can be used in other food ingredients. Uh, Quantec, that's in Hamilton, New Zealand. This one uh, is called Immune Defense Proteins. And um, it's got about 50 bioactive whey proteins in it. Some of the applications, um, removing bad breath, irritated throats, improving gum health, um, gut comfort, inhibits a number of viruses that are shown there. Uh, even there's a there's a, um, a skincare product that's supposed to do something for acne and dander of an athlete's foot. So very interesting. They also have a colostrum powder that's uh, added uh, with added lactoferrin in it. I'll have a lot of products, uh, the Lactoprodan brand listed there, and uh, I'll leave that for you to read uh, later on because it's just um, different variations of what uh, other companies are making. And uh, we have glycomacropeptide there uh, as well, right in the middle. And this has certainly increased a lot in the last few years, uh, what's come out of this, this company in Denmark. Um, so xanthine oxidase, this is an antibacterial compound found in the milk fat globule membrane. 
It's also used in conjunction with lactoperoxidase. So it's an interesting compound that has uh, various properties. It's been, uh, it, it can produce uric acid, uric acid crystals, which you'll see up here. It's a micrograph of them. And that uh, can inf uh, infiltrate the joints here and, and produce what's known as gout. Um, so there are different kinds of uh, drugs, including allopurinol, to try and prevent this reaction from occurring so you don't get gout. Uh, but it does have a role to play in, in uh, bacteria, static bactericidal properties. So this illustrates the importance of heat treatment and also the protective effect uh, of, um, of buttermilk and uh, different kinds of uh, um, dairy structures. So as we heat buttermilk, which is where you're going to find xanthine oxidase, you'll see that the activity drops off. Um, so pasteurization, this is for five minutes, so it's much longer than high temperature short time. Uh, we lose all activity about 80 degrees for five minutes. Uh, here we have no heat treatment, batch um, pasteurization, and we have cooling, and we also have adding salt, which is not commonly done to milk, but we threw that in just for fun to see what would happen. And we find that uh, uh, we get um, a loss of activity when it's batch pasteurized and high temperature short time, uh, but we actually get an increase when you cool it. And that may be because of its release from the surface of the milk fat globule membrane. Uh, this is the dairy matrix effect here. Uh, we find that, uh, and this is some results from our own lab a number of years ago, that when xanthine oxida oxidase is in solution, compared to buttermilk, the heating effect has a much more detrimental effect when it's in solution compared to when it's protected in a buttermilk environment. And you'll see the loss of activity here as we heat at 65 degrees compared to 75 degrees uh, over time. So that illustrates a very important point is we can protect, protect these bioactive compounds by using a dairy matrix when we heat it. A technology that can be used is encapsulation. And that can include a number of things such as um, emulsions, and it can be uh, um, uh, vesicles, it can be co-precipitation with a protective matrix. And when we're isolating these, or when we're putting into food products, or when we're digesting it, we need to protect that bioactivity, particularly if you'll see down here, if we're going to use a, a spray dryer to dry into a powder, which is often used for convenience to produce a bioactive ingredient that can be shipped quite easily uh, by heating. And uh, if we can develop technology such as encapsulation, we can protect the bioactivity, um, or we can use different kinds of drying technologies that produce, uh, that can be done at a lower temperature. So this is lactoferrin that's encapsulated uh, it's, their product is called in, Inferon, and from this is from Bega, New South Wales. And uh, this is a microencapsulated process. Uh, these are some other products that they produce down here. And uh, this prevents the lactoferrin from being digested by pepsin and acid in the stomach. So it can passage through the stomach. And when it passages through, it's going to uh, survive and be released in the intestines where it's going to be more effective. So this doesn't tell us much here. This is a patented process, of course, uh, and uh, this very, very simple diagram doesn't really tell us a lot. Uh, but we are doing some work at Ag Research on that, which has been published, so I can share a little bit more information. This is a technology where we've added uh, lactoferrin into um, uh, calcium carbonate. And the size of these calcium carbonate particles is something like about, ooh, about five to 10 micrometers in size. And uh, this is then, uh, going to retain more of the bioactivity uh, when it's used, when it's produced. And also it can be, uh, um, it has more of an, 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 a, a, a reluctance to be broken down by the acid and the pepsin that you'll find in, in the stomach. So this is all published work and it's a, a rather interesting uh, technology compared to uh, the one I showed you before with a lysozyme, uh, not a lysozyme, sorry, what he, it's a vesicle structure where you have complex lipids surrounding the lactoferrin. 
Uh, we can also use native structures such as casein micelles or the milk fat globule itself, or these double emulsions uh, or the liposomes themselves, which are vesicles to encapsulate these to protect them against acid and enzyme and uh, heat treatment. Or as I mentioned before, low impact drying, which are kind of which are very important if you want to uh, eliminate that uh, detrimental effect of heat. And there's a few listed here. One that's quite interesting is this electrostatic dry spray drying uh, for temperature sensitive materials and some work done at, um, I think of somewhere in Melbourne. I, I um, can't remember the name of the scientist who's working on this, but it's been uh, 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 heavily promoted by, by a company there. Right, finishing off, we have encapsulation of bioactive phenolics. Now, these phenolics were derived from green tea. Uh, this is some work we did uh, seven years ago. And uh, that was to, um, to uh, um, look at the, the, the phenolic health benefits of these products from green tea and the antioxidant functionality that they have. Now, there are a couple of ways to, to get a good dose of these polyphenolics. One is to drink an awful lot of tea. I guess you'd be spending a lot of time in the bathroom. Uh, the other way is to concentrate this up and put it into a cheese matrix where you get the same dosage. We found that when we did this, that all of the polyphenolics fell out of the cheese when we separated the curds and whey, which was not a good idea. So then we came up with this idea of encapsulating it. And, uh, and then that then tended to stick inside of the cheese matrix. The lighter color here is the fat, the darker color in the background is the protein phase of the cheese. And you'll see these very, very tiny white dots here. There's one there, there's one here, and there's a couple that are here. Those are the encapsulated polyphenolics. So they're very, very tiny, but they do bind to the protein and they stay in the cheese, um, much, much smaller than the fat globule that that's, you see that is attached to here. And so we found that uh, we were losing about two thirds of the polyphenolics. Uh, when we didn't encapsulate, when we did encapsulate, we retained 98% plus of them. So uh, very interesting. And that says exactly the same thing as what I've just said there. I'll leave that for you to read later on. So in conclusion, I think fermentation is a great opportunity to discover new bioactive compounds. Uh, rather than us doing it in the lab, let's get the microbes that do all the work for us and then try and find out what they do and see if they have health benefits. Isolation and purification methods impact upon bioactivity. Therefore, we need low impact processing technologies that can be done at a lower temperature. Bioactive ingredients can be put into food rather than used as supplements but they need to be protected from oxidative damage and also other damage that may occur in the food product during, shelf, uh, during the shelf storage. We can use encapsulation or we can incorporate into food micro matrices like a buttermilk system or a cheese system. We need a lot more testing uh, in vivo with uh, clinical trials to back up these health claims. There's a lot of health claims out there and not all regulatory authorities are equal. So it's, it's easy to promote these in places like Korea and Japan, but in Australia, North America, and Europe, it's more difficult to, um, to make these health claims. We need to retain the activity during digestion and target the right area in the human body. Something that's uh, becoming an increasing problem is antibiotic resistant bacteria. So we're running out of uh, antibiotics to, uh, uh, to uh, um, um, uses treatments. And so one possible avenue of research that might be productive in this area is to examine different kinds of antimicrobial peptides that have uh, bactericidal properties. Finally, humanization of infant milk formula, I think has uh, a huge potential in the dairy business. I think it's going to be the next biggest thing uh, that, we, uh, that we examine. So how do we have a long and healthy life? Well, that looks like a lot of hard work, doesn't it? I have a better way. I don't know whether you can see my, my screen here, but I have some kefir, and this is something that I've, I'm starting to enjoy. A lot of stuff found in kefir, a lot of probiotic compounds, and it's uh, found in the, the North Caucasus region, which has the most number of uh, uh, centenarians, people who live to more than 100 than any other place in the world, 
And that woman on the left with a walking stick apparently is 137 years old, um, but I don't know whether that's true or not, but certainly they have a, a much higher life expectancy and they, they eat a lot of this, uh, this uh, fermented milk product such as kefir. Right, I'm gonna leave it at that because I think I've used up pretty much all my time here. And uh, the way this is going to work is people can add questions into the chat and I'll stop sharing here so I can have a look at my chat box. Where is it? So now, I'll read the- I've popped a question in there, David, and it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, right, Th thank you, Jenny. That's, uh, well, that's a hard question. I'm not sure they can answer that one. Uh, where do you see the future for milk bioactive ingredients in supplements or in whole food products? You know, I, I think we've gone beyond astronaut food. If you go back to the 1960s, you, you, astronaut food is what they gave to people who went to the moon. And it was basically a bag of pills and tubes and stuff like that. That takes away the enjoyment of food, the whole social aspect of food. So I see the future of, uh, of these bioactive ingredients is, is in fermentation and also to see what are the health implications when we add different kinds of uh, fermentation microbes into food products such as milk and examine that, examining that more closely. So I see, I see the future is going to be in whole food products. All right. So folks, I hope a few of you have got some more questions there for David. Um, I've got another one coming up. What are the most pressing concerns right now for the development of new products? Um, let me think about that. I, I think um, regulatory hurdles is the obvious one. So if, if, if we discover something that has, based on a few clinical trials that looks like it might be promising, it's a long pathway to get that into a health claim that you can put on a label, if indeed you ever can. Sometimes they have to be softened. So that, that's, that is a, a pressing concern, but the development of new products, I, I think we need to look at new processing technologies that can retain that bioactivity, uh, something, things that we don't use now. Uh, and um, we need to be a little bit more creative, I think. Is, is to examine different kinds of bacteria, find out what's out there, do some surveys of bacteria and find out what they do in, in food products and what, what kind of bioactives they might be producing. Um, but I think the, the most interesting avenue, I, I, as I mentioned on my last slide, I think is the humanization of infant formula. I think that's just a, an area that's just ripe for more research, ripe for marketing and uh, producing commercial products. Uh, because of course there is a lot of um, backlash against using infant formula. Um, some companies back uh, decades ago uh, copped a lot of flack about that. Um, but um, yeah, so I think that's, that's, a, that's a promising area to get into. Um, I was quite fascinated at the start, and it's just amazing, <coughs> excuse me, how wonderful milk is for um, a nutritional perspective. And more and more, I think mm. people know that milk's good for them, but they, they really, we really need to find a new way of getting the message out there about all these wonderful things that it does contain. Yes. And, you know, I, I, I have conversations with people all the time. Sometimes I, I like to have, I play around with people's minds in restaurants. Um, uh, so, uh, and uh, I'll get to that in a second. But uh, one thing is people often tell me that they, they don't like dairy products because they get diarrhea or they get flatulence and, and they call it lactose intolerance. Well, I say, well, what do you eat? drink and they say well it's cheese basically well i say if you're if you're eating if you're eating ripened cheese you're not going to get an awful lot of lactose in fact you'll get almost none because of course it's a fermented product it's all it's fermented lactic acid and nobody's ever heard of lactic acid intolerance so um that, that's kind of a fun thing to do in restaurants is um, i've ordered cheese platters and i've i've said with all with my serious face oh is that gluten-free <laughs> And I'll say, um, well, I'll, I'll get back to you. I'll just check with the chef. Uh, yes, sir, it's gluten-free. Oh, good. Is it lactose-free? 
<laughs> and he'll run away again. The person I was having dinner with was absolutely horrified, and mortified that I was doing this. But the 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 waiter came back and said, oh, "I'm sorry, sir, it's a dairy product. It's got lactose in it." And I said, "Well, I'll risk it." <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, one of the big issues with milk is that uh, people say, well, we're eating a lot of cow's milk and that we're not cows. Well, that's true. But that doesn't mean it's not nutritious. Mm. It, it's not the same as human milk, of course, but it, it does have some nutritious compounds in it. Uh, Bernie, Barra Foods, is it likely that A2 opioid peptides sedative effects, the reason that digestive impact is perceived as less? And I'd never thought of that. That, that I don't know. Um, I don't know. Makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? But uh, I have no evidence to suggest that might be the case. Hmm, that's interesting. I might do a little bit of a search on that and see what I can find on, on the databases. Uh, there's another one from Jenny there. Do you see the future for precision fermentation for producing synthetic milk bioactive products? Yep. Okay, Bernie, I'll, I'll let you know if I, I don't know how I'll let you know, but I'll try. Yeah. Uh, especially considering the impact of sustainability issues and climate change on traditional dairy. Right. That's a big problem in Australia that has yet to come to New Zealand, but it probably will at some point is, is increasing uh, uh, levels of heat and less water. Uh, at the moment, we've got increasing levels of heat here in New Zealand, but we've got still got plenty of water. Uh, that's caused the amount of milk production in Australia to basically be something like 10 billion litres a year for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's um, a real problem. Um, one way to do that is to produce these bioactives using uh, bacterial bioreactors. So you can clone the gene that produces these into the bacterial cell or the yeast cell and then purify it from the reactor cells. Very, very, very expensive to do that. You also need pharmaceutical grade dairy processing facilities. So that's one of the, that's, that's the main reason it costs so much. Uh, companies are doing things like this now, Impossible Foods, uh, what's the other one? Impossible Burger or something. They're producing these uh, synthetic products that are based, uh, that are milk mimetics and meat mimetics. Um, yeah, I just, um, I, I think that that's gonna be a niche product. And I think countries like New Zealand uh, are going to continue for a, quite a while yet, unless climate change destroys us all, uh, to produce these um, the, these products that are derived from traditional dairying. And I think it's going to be, uh, I think we'll stick with that for the time being. Um, and it may increase in price too, as, as the price of these synthetic ones come down. Uh, any other questions there? No, I've just put in a link there, David, so people can provide feedback. If you copy that link, we'd really appreciate your feedback on today's webinar. So mm. with that, our time's up, David. Okay, thank you very much. And how do I get that uh, answer to back to Bernie again? Do oh, I... look, I know Bernie. I'll give you his email address. Okay, and I'll try and see, I'll see what I can find on that. Okay, then. David, thank you so much for all that um, work you've put into today's presentation. Much, much appreciated. And we look forward to meeting up again sometime. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you all. Bye.